Good morning. My name is Brother David Allen, and I'm a, a monk here at St. John's Abbey, but I'm also uh, one of our seminarians at the St. John's School of Theology. I've uh, been with the community uh, roughly for about 10 years, uh, but I um, also went to St. John's uh, for my undergraduate. So just welcome to all of you to Collegeville. If this is your first time, I, I do see a lot of familiar faces, which is always great to see. And I want to thank you just all for coming to this presentation and for uh, all the people at the university and diocese for helping with this morning's presentation, especially, of course, the monks of St. John's Abbey to use this beautiful space. We're in the Abbey Chapter House. This is where the big decisions are made, uh, but also to be on this beautiful campus here. Uh, the School of Theology and, of course, St. John's University Campus Ministry. I see Margaret over there. Hello. Uh, we're happy, of course, to have you, uh, whether you're here in person or watching us via live stream, be with us today. I want to give a special welcome, of course, to the watch parties around the diocese joining us online. This is our second gathering of the series dedicated to the Eucharistic revival. We will have one more regional meet meeting gathering in this series. Our main goal for these events are to provide more opportunities for ongoing formation, for opportunities to learn more about the Eucharist. If you're not aware, the Catholic Church in the, in the US began a three-year process to renew the love and understanding of the Eucharist in our lives through this Eucharistic revival. If you're interested in learning any more about, more about this, please visit the diocese website at stcdio.org. I'm not going to try to say that as a word, but that's stcdio.org. And just look under the tab that says Eucharistic Revival. In a moment, we'll begin with prayer and then welcome our guest speaker, hear her presentation. And then today we'll just close together again with prayer. For those joining us here in person, uh, we have a special tour of our reliquary chapel here at St. John's, followed by mass with the monastic community, probably pretty much right after this event. So around 11.30 p.m. a.m. in the Abbey Church, University Church, if you wish to join us. All are welcome, of course. Um, and I want to introduce uh, Sister Maria Trung, uh, one of us visiting sisters from Vietnam, uh, who is also studying at the St. John's School of Theology who will lead our opening prayer. Sister Trum. Hi, everyone. I am Sister Mary. Good morning, everyone. I am so happy to be present among you. So today we will open prayer. I will read my language. And you see in the screen your language. Let us stand. Please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lạy Chúa Giêsu, Chúa mời gọi chúng con để trở nên đôi tay, đôi chân vào thân thể của Chúa. Đặc biệt qua bí tích thánh tẩy, Chúa đã mời gọi chúng con phong phần vào tình yêu hiệp thông của ba ngôi Chúa Cha, Chúa Con và Chúa Thánh Thần. Vì thế, xin ban thánh linh của Ngài cho chúng con để làm sống động tâm hồn chúng con đối với đôi mắt và đôi tay đức tin để chúng con thấy và cảm nghiệm Chúa Kitô đang hiện diện ở giữa chúng con. 
Xin giúp chúng con khám phá sự đầy đủ của bản sắc mỗi người trong chúng con. Với tư cách là thành viên của nhiệm thể Chúa Kitô, được tạo thành từ nhiều bộ phận, được nuôi dưỡng bởi một thân thể duy nhất là Đức Giêsu Kitô, Chúa chúng ta. Được người sai đi với sứ mạng biến đổi cộng đồng, làng xóm, làng mạc và toàn thể thế giới. Để thi hành sứ mạng Chúa trao cách tốt đẹp, xin Chúa hướng dẫn chúng con biết khao khát sống đời sống tự hiến của thánh thể, luôn biết ơn về tình yêu và lòng thương xót của Ngài, được ánh sáng tin mừng hướng dẫn để xây dựng một thế giới hiệp nhất trong sự hiệp thông với Ngài. Chúng con cầu xin nhờ Đức Giêsu Kitô, Chúa chúng con. We are through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Sister Trung. So our guest today, Dr. Daniel Zupsan Jerome, is Director of Ministerial Formation and Field Education at St. John's University School of Theology and Seminary in, right here in Collegeville, Minnesota. Uh, Dr. Daniela, as I know her as, but uh, I, I think she's pretty okay with that being what we call her, <laughs> is a, a, a wonderful researcher. And her, her research explores the in intersection of social communication, digital culture, and pastoral theology. She has served as a consultant to the United States Con Conference of Catholic Bishops, Committee on Communications, and as an educational consultant to the Catholic Media Association, and also as a tutor for the Vatican's Dicastery of Communication, Faith, Communication, and a Digital Age project. Welcome, Danielle. Thank you. Thank you. Allow me a moment to put up my slides. And we can begin. This is visible? Okay. So thank you for the kind introduction. As uh, Brother David Allen said, I'm a pastoral theologian who works here at the School of Theology and Seminary, and um, I study the intersection of ministry and social communication and digital culture. So um, I have some reflections on that today and to how to connect it to our life of faith, especially our spirit um, as transformed by the Eucharist. First of all, I think you maybe resonate with this from what I have observed, and maybe you've observed this too, we're truly living in this extraordinary moment of time in history where the technologies we have created are truly shaping the way that we live our lives. We can call this properly a digital culture. Very little of what we are doing today is untouched by the digital. And even if one is not actually engaging with a device, a computer or a cell phone, our thoughts and assumptions about our daily life and its regular tasks have shifted tremendously because of the availability of these devices. Like how we get to places, how we do errands, how we shop, how we learn, how we find information, how we recreate, how we socialize, how we maintain social bonds, keep up with people, and even sometimes how we experience our faith. These have changed fundamentally because of digital culture. I would say the world and how we live in it is simply not the same as it was even just a few decades ago. Digital culture, I wanna start with just stating that it brings a lot of blessings. And there's many ways that this is a, a really gifted context. The way that we can access information and connect with other people across time and space is something that I think is truly extraordinary and was unfathomable even some years ago. Um, my family and I were immigrants from Eastern Europe. We've been here in the United States for about 30 years. And I remember when we moved over, um, 
like writing letters back and forth with our family back home because phone calls are too expensive. And so we physically wrote letters and physically mailed them. Um, I still remember the red and blue edge striped envelope and all that. Um, contrast that with this picture here, which is a picture of me FaceTiming with my grandmother um, with my, when my little son was um, you know, uh, smaller than he is now anyway, he wasn't just newborn. And them seeing each other on the screen, like this was unfathomable some decades ago. Um, and just a, a meaningful, beautiful thing. In addition to personal connections like this, we've gained also, I think, the experience of being aware of and connected to people at a greater distance in real time, in a way that evokes compassion and solidarity and a shared sense of humanity. So I will never forget, for example, during COVID, seeing pictures or videos of people on balconies singing to each other. Um, I think Italy and some other places, or more recently and sadly, images of Ukrainians huddled in their subway stations. Or even last week, something as sad as, while we're celebrating Halloween here, people in South Korea in a, in a stampede experiencing an awful accident uh, for their Halloween celebrations. So these moments are no longer over yonder, far away somewhere. We're recognizing our brothers and sisters in, in stories that have really become proximate because of digital culture. And I think that's also extraordinary. We all know though that digital culture, um, while it has all this abundant connectivity and all this information, also has a number of challenges that we've experienced in this context. For example, information overload and its cognitive impact, or the lack of trust that in, in terms of assessing information that we see on the screen, the idea of misinformation, or the idea of algorithm cur curated content feeds, not knowing quite well where information comes from and who organized it for us to be in, in front of us in that fashion. Ambiguity around truthfulness of content. Or more broadly, technocentric or consumption-centric models of interaction and engagement, the commodification of the human person as just a source of data that advertisers um, pay companies for, um, or even the idea similar to that of the perception of the human person as just this interconnected node in this web, rather than a relational person in community with dignity. There are larger issues like this, and these yield more specific symptoms that we must all be aware of on some level, like not knowing what is truthful information or even divisiveness, um, animosity, vitriol and comment feeds, the spirit of self-promotion, chasing after clicks and likes and views, um, the screen sucking our time away and robbing our attention, clickbait articles and things like that, or even human skills and their diminishment, such as our ability to be with people face-to-face -face and listen well and extend empathy, maintain eye contact, just to name a few. So from the perspective of faith, discipleship and ministry, especially given these challenges, I continue to think about what would make digital culture a life-giving and dignifying context for all. I'm a firm believer that digital culture, first of all, I think it's here to stay. And second, I, I think it's not set in stone. I think that it is what we human persons shape it to be. So how do then we as people of faith approach this context, this way of living our lives intentionally? How do we assert the humanity, assert the dignity back into this cultural context? How do we strive to live well? So I have some reflections on this today. Digital culture, first of all, is a culture that's built on communication and its technologies, right? So therefore, what we assume about communication is really impactful for how we think about living well in this context. I think for most of us on the surface level, we think of communication something like the way we exchange information. This is like a basic definition. Communication is us exchanging information. But if we pause a little bit and think from the perspective of faith, communication actually has a much more profound, much more human definition um, than that. One that looks at this activity not as this exchange of content, 
but first of all, a relational gesture. When we communicate, we first and foremost share of ourselves with another. And deeper than this, from the perspective of faith, communication has a theology. And this theology is about relating well. It builds on the theology of who God is and how God relates. Our God is relational. The Christian God is relational. And we, we think about God and reflect on the mystery of the Trinity, God existing in the persons of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as related and as self-giving and in this loving mutual relationship. And this extends to humankind. And out of this, God relates also with creation and with the human person in the same manner. God relating with us is expressed, of course, most fully in Jesus, who is the incarnate word, incarnate word. Jesus has a communication name, and I love that. And from the beginning of the incarnation to the ongoing movement of the Holy Spirit animating us now, God is one who continues to communicate. God shares God's self with us as a gift of self in love. And God does this to bring us into relationship with God and with one another, and ultimately into communion. And I think this brief theology is what really gives meaning to human communication and how we try to live well in this context. So for the person of faith, communication is built on this. When we communicate, it's a gift of ourselves that we offer to another in love. And this is meant to build relationships it's meant to edify community, and it's meant to ultimately be oriented toward the idea of communion. And I've thought for a long time about communication and communion in these ways. That's part of, that's so central to my work and my research. But communion, of course, is also this beautiful theological word that also brings to mind something that's very much the heart of Christian life and practice, the communion of the Eucharist, the reception of God's body and blood. So then I wonder how are the two related? Communication oriented toward communion and the practice of receiving communion in the sacrament. We mentioned already this idea of gift of self offered in love as this Christian theological definition of communication. Gift of self offered in love can also precisely describe what is happening on the altar in the context of the Eucharist. This is my body given up for you. This is my blood poured out for you. God's gift of self lovingly extended to us in sacrament. So we can even say that God communicates God's self profoundly in the Eucharist and that the Eucharist is a supreme act of divine and human communication. And I think that's so transformative for us. And the idea that our Eucharistic participation shapes and transforms us in a way that can impact how we live and communicate, and especially in this context of digital culture that's ours to shape. So, so far we have this beautiful theological connection between communication and the Eucharist, but what does it have to do with the way we live our lives? The life of faith that's lived out in the world today in the context that's digital? Like how can this impact and infuse that? How can the Eucharist transform my real presence and yours in digital spaces? So this year, um, these, these couple of years now, we're uh, reflecting on the Eucharist in this context of revival. And among the theological and spiritual insights, I hope we can revive and recall and take with us and reinforce is this renewed appreciation for what it means for us to receive the Eucharist, to be transformed by the Eucharist, to live Eucharistically. And this is actually a very old idea, but it's always worth repeating. St. Augustine, um, Bishop of Hippo, preached this to his community in the fifth century already. And we have these beautiful homilies we can still read from him about this. He would point to the altar and he would say, look at the bread, look at the wine. Be what you see, receive what you are. And he was so strong in asserting that. And nowadays we often say it like this, become what you receive. And church teaching and contemporary theologians continue to think about this. Um, the Second Vatican Council, for example, and its teaching on the liturgy 
taught us that the Eucharistic liturgy is the source and summit of Christian life. So it's not just contained in, in the church building in the tabernacle, it's the source and summit of our whole lives. Um, contemporary theologian and my friend from Notre Dame, Tim O'Malley, has written on becoming a Eucharistic people, living out of the transformative experience of the liturgy as a community day by day. And he'll be with us next fall to teach more about this, which I think is really exciting. So when we receive communion, when we say amen to the body and blood of Christ, we present ourselves to be transformed by God's self-giving, loving presence in there. And God's real presence becomes presence in real life, in mine and in yours, not just on the altar table, not just in the tabernacle, but in our daily activities, in our lives as Christian disciples. I like this quote from Pope Benedict. He said in a document in 2007, he says, there's nothing authentically human, whether our thoughts or our affections or words and deeds, that does not find in the sacrament of the Eucharist the form it needs to be lived in full. That does not find in the sacrament of the Eucharist the form it needs to be lived in full. I love this idea of form. And it's really worth thinking more about. What form does the Eucharist give our daily activities? And pertaining to our reflection here on digital culture, what form can the Eucharist give to our communication on sharing of self in these, in these spaces? Digital culture, as any culture, um, has its own proper values and beliefs and practices and language. And one of the valued practices of digital culture is the idea of storytelling. On social media networks, on video channels, on blogs, nothing is more compelling than a person narrating content from their experiential point of view. So from the person sharing a recipe on our blog to an influencer unboxing a product or trying something out, they're always telling stories. And we're drawn into these stories. And stories have become powerful drivers for digital culture itself. They are a proper language form in this context. I really appreciate the point of view from Tim Welch, who was a longtime minister in this diocese and who was also now an author who's recently published on digital ministry. Um, in a conversation some months ago, he reminded me that whoever tells the stories shapes culture. So in digital culture, I wonder, what are the stories we are telling as people of faith? And how can the Eucharist give form to these? So how does the Eucharist give form to our stories? What is that form? How might we recognize and narrate Eucharistic truth and wisdom in the events of our lives? Now, whether we're concerned about actually posting uh, content on social media or not, or if it's a broader question, this idea of discovering a Eucharistic presence in our life lived and narrating that, telling the story of that is fundamental, I think, for Christian discipleship today. It's really a language form that our culture in this digital context is calling for. How do we tell our stories? So I myself thought about this with some intention today. And I wanna share with you some Eucharistic shaped stories from my life. And I offer these to show how the Eucharist can infuse life lived and even give language and language and form for meaningful things that we experience. And this is ours to discover, discovering how the Eucharist gives meaning and language in life then shows how it can give form more intentionally to how we go about communicating and relating with others and telling stories in our digital spaces as well. So the Eucharist is an act of communication and it can shape our communication with others. And I think this has such tremendous potential for how we can live transformatively in digital culture. So the, the few stories I have now, I hope, can give a, a small glimpse of how, but really it's about giving us a sense of how to discover stories like this in our lives and telling them. My first story is about Helen. Helen is a person I have known for about 10 years. 
and she is one of these really inspiring professionals who has held many important leadership roles. When I met with, when I first met her, I was just starting out in my career and she was well established in hers. And from the very beginning, she was above all generous and kind and encouraging. And I thought she went out of her way to be so. She was just such a generous person. And in fact, that's how I recall meeting her as this lovely, encouraging, warm person. And then when I discovered the extent of her professional achievements, I was very humbled. Since I have known her, she has always taken the time to extend to me, and I'm sure many others, encouragement and mentorship and wisdom and humor and honesty. And all the while, I'm aware she's had much, much bigger, often global size commitments going on. And so she's really inspired me along the way, not just because of her professional achievements, but above all, because of this grace and generosity to be this self-giving person. And when one is starting out, like I was when I first met her, receiving such generosity, such a gift of self, felt undeserved, a true grace and a gift, almost prophetic. And because maybe this is more so a comment about our professional world and our greater culture, but we're really, I feel, are encouraged to achieve on our own and over against or in competition with another person. And she's a really different kind of person than that. And I was humbled and I was grateful. So Helen is one who has illustrated for me what it means to give a gift of oneself to another and to do it freely and gracefully and generously and how this gives life to another person. And the Eucharist has language for this. This is my body given up for you. This is my blood poured out for you. I feel really grateful for knowing her and that too, that gratitude is held by the Eucharist that posture of thanksgiving that the sacrament calls us into as a response to self-gift. Self-gift offered in love, a form of communication that is shaped by the Eucharist. How do we tell our story in this digital culture? How does self-gift in love give form then to our communication practices in these spaces? I think of the spirit sometimes we find on social media and the spirit we're actually maybe even called to bring there that's in a different way. Because social media too is not unlike the professional world, heavily shaped by self-promotion and your own content and your own likes and that sort of thing, gaining clicks and comments on one's own. And so this would gain influence and this gains visibility and this gains power and in some cases money for people who monetize off of this. So how does self-giving in love a spirit of that, enter into a space like this? What might our content and comments look like when made with grace and generosity above all? So this is one thing I continue to think about. Another Eucharistic story in my life is that of Elise. While I know Helen well, Elise was a person who inspired me more so from like a distance. She was a member of our church community and we didn't really know each other that well. Um, but Elise and her husband and their children were and are cherished members of the community who shared their gifts in many ways where we went to church. She also suffered from cancer, which the community witnessed over six years before she died in 2020. I didn't know Elise well, but I got to know about her because she told her story on social media and through a blog she kept. And she shared her faith and her charity so profoundly as she battled cancer. And this gathered people. It gathered people around her in these digital spaces through the stories that she told there. There's a Facebook group that was created during her illness. And it's still active now, some years after her death. And it's still sharing faith and stories and prayers now for other cancer patients and other survivors. So Elise was this inspiring woman of faith and courage in my life, whose memory still brings inspiration as I think of her. And it brings an idea of hope and I'm awed by the way that it gathers community. And the Eucharist has language for this too. 
do this in memory of me. And her life and her death taught me what it means to abide in a living memory with others and how this living memory gathers community and continues to inspire, to actually give life, even through death. Do this in memory of me. Another Eucharistic form of communication. When thinking of digital culture, then how does this form give shape to our communication practices? I was thinking about telling the story again and how the story is a living story. Our story of faith, the story of Christ, the gospel, it's a living story. A story that speaks to our life as lived, but also gives life. And it's also a story in that life that gathers community. And in that gathering, people find meaning and belonging and purpose and hope through that story of faith that we share. So I wonder then about how we might approach social communication and digital culture with that spirit. So would my, po my postings, my comments, my contributions, do they aim to bring alive the story of faith? Do my, do my postings and contributions gather people? Do I extend hospitality and form community? Do I offer hope? Do I represent the story of faith as a living communion? Or is it reduced to some conceptual artifact, a thing I post, or worse, a weapon to defeat another point of view? Do this in memory of me. The third story that's Eucharistic from my life is the story of Miss Tina. Tina is a person who works in ministry, and she was also a student in the very first class I ever taught some 10 years ago. And that was an online class. But I still remember her joy and her enthusiasm and her spirit was such that it could not be contained by a threaded discussion board. Like she just was, she just brought her spirit so strongly. And I loved working with her. And if you're students, guess what? The, the spirit that you bring to class, your professors appreciate that. You know, we really appreciate that. And I still remember her spirit from 10 years ago. So after she finished her studies, I would see Miss Tina once in a while at local ministry conference or settings like this, actually. And she and her spouse always came and said hello and brought their big joy. And we're still Facebook friends. And to this day, she will faithfully comment on my content with the same enthusiasm and spirit and sometimes you know, like emojis and things like that. Um, where there's Tina, there's big joy. The last time I saw Miss Tina in person was a few years ago. And it was again at a local ministry conference in the exhibit hall. And I was stopping by there on my way from a difficult meeting and it was like truly an awful day. And she didn't know this. And she came and she said her big hello and we hugged. And in the hug, like my hard day got a better of me and my tears started to well up just from the fact. And without missing a beat, without stopping and asking about any details, she just hugged me for a moment longer. And she said, it will be okay. And that was it. She never knew the details, but I will never forget that it will be okay. In that moment, it was so certain and so true from her and it was spirit led. And the Eucharist has language for this. As she encouraged me with a simple moment of healing at a time I was wounded, I'm thinking about this now. And it was this phrase, Lord, I'm not worthy that you shall enter into my home, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Say the word and my soul shall be healed. As God's words give life and restore life, so should our words be life-giving and healing for others. Pope Francis has very often reflected with the parable of the Good Samaritan and how that speaks to digital culture and how we ought to be communicating in the spirit of that. He says in particular how digital culture calls us for our words to be like the balm and the wine that the Samaritan used to tend to the wounds of the victim of robbery. Words of healing, words that are life-giving, words that are restorative, 
words that reconcile. Further than that, they should actually speak to the wounds, like not shy away, from, but like tend to the wounds and address pain and address brokenness and, and see where, where there is yearning for that good news in, in life, in the souls of people, in the hearts of people, and aim to speak to that and bring life to that. And this is very different than the often sort of sarcastic, mean-spirited speech forms we see when people try to like up one the other with their clever comments especially on comment feeds. Sarcasm, by definition, tears the flesh. Balm and wine heal. So how can we bring this form of speech that captures this spirit? I'll end by uh, uh, this brief comment here and then we'll open some conversation. Um, again, digital culture is not set in stone. I'm firmly a believer that we are what we make it and why not make it? life-giving and abundant and good as it's unfolding and we're living in it. And as people of faith, I think there's a prophetic call there for us to shape the way we live in this context, especially so that this idea of it being life-giving and dignifying for all could come to be. The church says the Eucharist is the source and summit of our lives. So how our participation in the sacrament gives form to our lives um, including communication, has tremendous potential for living well in this cultural context. This is ours to shape. So I shared with you some of these stories about the Eucharist and how it, it brought meaning to my life beyond the worship space. Um, and I want to extend an invitation to you to a couple of things now um, to give a chance to have a, um, some conversation maybe amongst yourselves or maybe just reflect on some questions here on this. So I prepared some questions for that to give it five to seven minutes for you just to gather your thoughts and maybe converse with others if you want to a little bit beyond this. And then I wanna invite us back in a large group conversation and take some comments and engage as a, a group together. Um, if you are joining us by way of um, video conference, then I, I we invite you to um, chat with others with these questions if you want to for the next five to seven minutes or just sit with them. And then when we transition to large group conversation, then we'll use the Q&A for people at a distance to type in their actual questions, okay? So let's take about five to seven minutes now, and I invite you to sit with these questions, um, and then we'll come back as a large, uh, a large group in a little bit. And if you want to, you can turn to the people next to you um, and maybe just have a brief conversation. Okay, welcome back. I hope you had a chance to visit and make some new friends a little bit here. It's always, I have, uh, I always uh, appreciate opportunities like this to connect with people in the local church. Um, so now we wanted to create an opportunity for some large group conversation and comments, questions, um, and we'll also be taking them as well from our online participants. So um, we have Bailey with a microphone who can come to you if you'd like to make a comment or a question. And then we have, um, we have our friends from the diocese here fielding some of the online questions as well. So I just want to open up and see how did this sit with you? Um, any impressions you'd like to share or maybe comments that you have, I'd be most grateful for. We'd be most grateful for. Hi, I'm Dee Dee from uh, the Church of St. Joseph. And in our small group, we discussed that uh, two out of three of us sort of avoid digital communication because they just find it as very negative based. But what I heard from your uh, communication, Daniela, is that we are called to bring a more positive message to that. And it might be just a, a motivational message, Bible verse, et cetera, that could be posted occasionally uh, for people within that circle of influence. But, but we also commented that sometimes you see these copy and paste kind of messages that feel very impersonal mm -hmm. and you don't really like to participate in that. But I think we can be called to, uh, whether it's digitally or of course personally, just to represent in a positive manner and a, an encouraging manner because uh, that kind of communication is uh, of course, I'm going to help somebody. Mm -hmm. To encourage and to extend a, extend a sense of presence, 
a sense of another human person there. I, I too, I too love that. And you know, those of you in the room whom I know and may be connected with uh, on these platforms, I love when you share photos or images or some genuine update from your life. I think that's really like, even if we don't see each other day to day, I have a sense of where people are because of the th these things, you know, particularly like with you and your travels, because we're connected. And I think that's the spirit of it. And I too agree, there's so much negativity, negativity on there. And like, then what is our proper response to that? And I think maybe there is a boundary where there's just so much, th there's just so much nonsense one can absorb in a day, right? And like, I think it is healthy to step away and discern, like, is it life-giving for me to be looking at this nonsense or be sucked into something that truly is not of God and to have that discernment and rather like not to escape the, the platform at all, but rather how to bring another kind of message that's prophetic and life-giving. I so believe that this is part of our baptismal call. Like whether one creates a blog or a YouTube channel or just has a posting once in a while, I, you know, there's a range, <laughs> but it's part of our baptismal call to be people of faith who share good stories and good news of, of life and meaning with the world. And this is a communication context that's really begging for that. Um, so I think there are some very good insights in your conversation. Thank you for, share, for sharing. Other thoughts? My name is Amber and I had the pleasure of speaking with Deacon Jeff. And uh, one of the things that he said that really stuck with me is the idea of journeying with somebody. Mm -hmm. And uh, And then I've, contemplated that a little bit further in in the digital aspect and how um you can serve as witness to somebody very easily right but to choose the road of journeying with mm -hmm. somebody through their whether it's pain or um mm -hmm. joy um it, that that calls us to something different right mm -hmm. and how to create it create the interaction that happens online um from to take it from a response or just a very surface level to really engaging in a journeying with somebody way um, and what that looks like. Because I think that Jesus did that. You know, the, mm -hmm. the Eucharist is calling us to journey with people. Um, and that's not easy. So that was a message I took from Deacon Jeff today. Thank you both. I think that's a really insightful comment too. And I think it's it calls for a, a way of mutuality too, to really journey with someone. Um, I think of Elisa's story who I had up in the middle who created a blog while she suffered with cancer and like narrated her thoughts and narrated her prayer and um, just like the treatments and the ups and downs and like that for me invited a journey but also that took from her this this willingness and this position to put herself out there you know and to share and make a gift of herself in her illness and her many other obligations, I'm sure she made a gift of herself with this story that invited journey because I wanted to keep up and wanted to know how she was and like offer prayers. So I think to journey with is like that already is like a relational thing that involves more than just the one person's intention, but it's an invitation to really like encounter a person. Um, so there's a lot more to think with there, but I really think that's a beautiful idea that goes beyond, I'm going to post this content and like it lands in like some, you know, um, detached cyberspace somewhere. Like how are we finding other people and keeping up with them? So thank you for your insightful thought on that. Dr. Daniela, we have a question from one of our uh, online viewers. I loved your focus on bringing a loving presence to our social media spaces, Dr. Daniela. How can we better incorporate discernment and spaces for discerning in our use of digital media? So they, you want me to repeat or do you think they picked it up? Okay. Um, yes, I'm so glad that um, this question uses spiritual language of discernment. I really do think that some of these questions of how to live well as a person of faith in these spaces are fundamentally spiritual questions rather than technical ones. So when I ever have, whenever I have this conversation, I like to, you know, not begin with what platform we use to get more clicks or, or outreach, but rather like, how do we have a disposition? And that's a spiritual question. And I think one thing concretely in response to that is to reclaim our agency to create spaces for our reflection. So digital culture and the way that information moves is so fast and it's so rapid and it's always flowing, it seems to me. And I don't, I think one challenge often we don't have the time and space there to really like sit 
and absorb and understand the full context and engage with something thoughtfully because of its pace. So I think the sermon in a digital context is partially reclaiming space for people to do so, to like naturally reinsert proper time and space needed for thoughtful reflection into a communication practice that's been sped up and like magnified. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's okay to be thoughtful and, and step away and not be impulsive when we're finding ourselves in maybe exchanges um, to take the time and to sit prayerful, we want to say. Uh, I know sometimes that's easier said than done, but I think I would start there. And I'd like, I would welcome other thoughts or comments on that as well. Or reflections back. Yes, please. Well, Casey from St. Boniface in Cold Spring. Uh, I was inspired by your stories of sharing these ladies that you have come into contact with. I always like listening to people talk about their faith. Um, I like to think that I do that well as also I like to tell stories and uh, share what I can from what I feel God is calling me to. As I was talking to sister uh, today, I was reminded uh, I was in the Holy Land probably eight or 10 years ago very inspired by that experience being with a group of people and experiencing all of the places that uh, Jesus was at and when I read the scriptures it became so much more alive as I would read that but as I was telling sister I did a, I made video sections of various things that I saw and experienced while I was there and it's sitting it's been sitting for eight or ten years and as a reminder again this morning, you need to put that together. I want to share it with other people, but so other people can have some of that same kind of faith experience that I had. So it was just a good reminder to me. Thank you. I think that you're absolutely right. And I, again, the way we tell our story, I was really intentional today, not just to lecture on theology for 35 minutes, which I can also do, but rather to um, really tell the stories of how this is like meaningful in my life to illustrate this. Well, like, this is what captures the attention. I'm hopeful that when you walk away from this talk, I think you'll, you'll remember Helen and Tina and Elise much more than like my exposition on communication theology. Hopefully maybe that landed a little bit too, but the stories are, are really, they really are compelling and the way we create them and tell them, um, gosh, that's where it's at. I think this is where we can really capture the attention of people who are seeking for good news. And whether it's through images or even sharing of one's travels. I traveled recently um, and I shared my pictures of that um, on social media. And so many people that I haven't been in contact with or I only see in passing have come up to me and said, oh, you went, you went to Rome and it was so lovely. What was that like? And that already created an opportunity for conversation. And I love that, you know. So um, great point. Okay, so I'm aware of our time. Um, I want to uh, definitely thank you for your uh, participation and your presence today. I understand there's a, a few closing comments. And then after that, if you'll kindly stay, there's an opportunity to tour the, the relics that are downstairs, which I know is not always open. Um, so that comes up at 11 o'clock and then 1130 there's mass at the Abbey Church. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. My name is Janet Dusek, and I work for the Dia Diocesan Office of Marriage and Family. So I'll just make some closing remarks here. Um, again, thank you for being with us today. Uh, we want to remind all of you to please join us for our next regional ministry gathering, which will be taking place on November 16th in Princeton uh, with Arturo Salgado, Anne McCarney, and Father Kevin Anderson. And the title of that is Love Stories of the Eucharist, Yours, Mine, and Ours. So they will be sharing testimony. This event will be open for in-person and live stream viewing. And all of our events will be recorded for later viewing. So you can check that out on the diocesan website uh, under the Eucharist, Eucharistic Revival um, tab. I also want to invite you to take one of these books uh, in the back. Um, it is a Eucharist and prayer work workbook, and you can use them for individual reflection or for small group discussions. 
They are provided by the Bridge Builders for a Thriving Mission Initiative. So with that, let us pray. Loving God, you who breathed life into our very being, teach us to live the Eucharistic revival in our lives. You who formed us to be your voice, hands, and heart. Show us how to become Christ to one another. You who imparted us with gifts and charisms, empower us to rise to use them in service and in love. You who offered us the ultimate sacrifice of your son, help us to offer ourselves wholeheartedly for the life of the world. In your name, we go forth saying, amen. Okay, one other quick announcement. If you would like to tour the Abbey Reliquary, please meet Bailey in the back of the room. Thank you all for joining us today. <laughs>